this week I sat down with Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best selling author, who's reported from war zones in Latin America, the Middle East, and beyond. His most recent book is titled Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. Hedges is also the host of the new show on Telesort English, Days of Revolt, with new episodes airing every Monday night. From someone who's been on the receiving end of bullets from El Salvador to Iraq and covered uprisings from North Africa to Europe, I wanted to talk to him about war, propaganda, and revolt. Chris, Eugene Debs, famous socialist candidate uh, back during World War I, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his opposition to it. And in fact, the Sedition Act made it illegal for anyone to speak in opposition to the war at that time. What does that say about the myth of democracy from that early on? Well, it says that if you challenge the structures of power, and in particular, particularly military power, you are at best marginalized, if not imprisoned. You know, those kind of few radical voices that held fast, Randolph Bourne, Jane Addams, Eugene Debs, were um, excoriated in the press, Emma Goldman eventually deported along with Alexander Berkman and others. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, war, as Randolph Bourne said, is the health of the state. And what you saw in World War I was the rise of the military corporate machine uh, which made war against these radicals through the Sedition Act, the Espionage Act, and more importantly, uh, the Committee for Public Information or the Creel Commission, which created the system of modern mass propaganda, employing the understanding of crowd psychology pioneered by figures like Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud, that people were not moved by fact or reason. They were moved by the very skillful manipulation of emotion. And, uh, and it worked. So you had Hollywood was making films like uh, the Kaiser, the Butcher of Berlin. Uh, the Creel Commission had its own news division. You couldn't, you couldn't even write anti-war editorials. It was against the law. Um, it had speakers bureaus. Uh, and you only had to use the Sedition Act and espionage on uh, those kind of few figures who held fast to an anti-war stance, of which there were not many. And you read uh, uh, people like Jane Addams, and uh, part of what they are most depressed about is how easily the intellectual class, even the purportedly left intellectual class, was seduced into the war effort. And then after the war, the dreaded Hun becomes the dreaded Red, uh, and we enter what Dwight MacDonald calls this psychosis of permanent war in the name of anti-communism. You know, war, the fusion of war and, uh, and the war profiteers, the militarists and the war profiteers, which after World War II created a situation of total war. I mean, after World War I, factories reconverted for domestic, to produce domestic products. After World War II, they kept producing weapons, even though we had peace, uh, so that we could obliterate every Soviet city 10 times over with nuclear weapons. I mean, it was nuts. Um, but with you know guaranteed cost overruns and guaranteed profits, uh, that fusion of the militarists and the corporatists hijacked the country, uh, disemboweled the country economically, and made war on all of those advances that had come under the New Deal. This, so it had mm -hmm. both an economic impact and a political impact. Uh, and the U.S. is undoubtedly the world's biggest, most strongest empire, history's biggest and strongest empire, but it operates in a different way than empires past. How has the notion of empire changed over the last century? America is unique in the sense that it colonized itself. So European countries colonized India, Africa, the Spanish, you know, and the Americas. Uh, we destroyed through acts of genocide. Uh, our indigenous communities and plundered their resources. So you had, especially with westward expansion, uh, the U.S. cavalry acting on behalf of the mining concerns, the, the railroad companies, the timber merchants. And once westward expansion was complete, by the end of the 19th century, you began expansion beyond U.S. borders. That's when you had the Cuban-American War with the seizure of Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, you began to see all sorts of gunboat diplomacy uh, throughout the Caribbean and uh, Latin America, in particular Central America. America expanded its power uh, 
uh, certainly through the military force and the threat of military force, uh, but more by cultivating indigenous elites that would do our bidding. So you saw the rise of all sorts of dictatorships, you know, whether it was Mobutu in the Congo or whether Somoza in Nicaragua or the Shah in Iran, and of course we overthrew the Shah's father and then carried out a coup d'etat uh, to replace Mossadegh, the prime minister who was going to nationalize British oil. Um, and, uh, you know, that form of colonial power uh, protected Western interests. That's why Allende was overthrown in 1973 and Pinochet was put in power to protect the copper industry from being nationalized. Um, and these elites were given tremendous resources. I mean, you saw the same thing in 1954 in Guatemala with Arbenz, who wanted to uh, challenge United Fruits huge acquisition of Guatemalan land to give landless peasants, you know, an ability to, you know, carry out subsistence farming. And, um, and when that happened, they, the CIA raised a kind of black army, a huge propaganda effort run by Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations who had come out of the Creole Commission. Um, and of course, you know, Arbenz becomes uh, a communist in the eyes of the press, which they uh, you know, through the manipulation of, of the press, they are able to justify this. So it's a different kind of um, empire in the sense that, you know, for instance, you know, British troops actually occupied India, though many of those troops were Sikhs, raised from the Sikhs. Um, we, we find, uh, you know, venal elites who we'll do our bidding and when uh, people rise up against those elites, then we provide those elites with the resources um, by which they can crush uh, any form of, of rebellion. I wanted to talk about El Salvador in particular because mm. you've seen, I mean, you've obviously covered extensively the horrors of UF, US wars all right. over the region. What did this conflict in particular reveal about the lengths the empire will go to maintain economic hegemony? So it's 1979 and the Sandinistas win in Nicaragua. Um, and this sets off all kinds of alarm bells because the Sandinistas, uh, unlike Somoza, who was the dictator of Nicaragua, was overthrown uh, and later assassinated um, in Paraguay, um, were not going to protect U.S. business interests. And uh, they did not want to see this spread throughout the region. And so I covered the war there from 1983 to 1988. Um, and we saw the Reagan administration pump tremendous military, economic, intelligence resources into defeating the rebel group known as the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. Um, I mean, when I first got to El Salvador in 1983, the FMLN was winning the war, um, they created the Reagan administration, they brought in a huge uh, helicopter fleet, 70 Hueys that they put up in the air, which made it hard for these guerrilla uh, groups to mass in any kind of large military. I mean, in, the, in 83, I was able to go out with up to seven, 800 rebels at a clip. That didn't happen anymore. Um, they created whole black armies that were recruited from Venezuela, Chile, Honduras, and other places that didn't exist. They were ghost armies. Um, Roughly, or battal they call them Cazador, hunter battalions. They're about 350, very well trained, very well equipped. And we would go up into Morazan and uh, come upon the aftermath of tremendous fire. And yet there was no record of a Salvador or an army ever being there. Uh, yeah. They brought in uh, all sorts of CIA, mostly ex-Cuban operatives, including Felix Rodriguez, who had been uh, part of the effort to hunt down Che Guevara. Indeed, he would show us Che Guevara's wristwatch that he was wearing, taken off Che's body. Um, so uh, there's a kind of classic example of the heavy intrusion of empire uh, to thwart. I mean, half of the population in El Salvador at the time was landless. Mm -hmm. And most of the land was owned by these uh, coffee barons, roughly 10 families, they call them, the big 10 families, 
it was, uh, you know, it was worse than serfdom. People living in tremendous poverty and deprivation. And when they tried to organize peacefully in terms of building labor unions, uh, they were literally gunned down in the streets. Uh, I mean, they put machine guns up on the roofs of buildings and capital. And, and then uh, when people began to resist the death squads, when I got to the country, we were killing between 700 and 1,000 people a month. Uh, it was, yeah, it was butchery, which we funded and largely orchestrated. You saw the same thing in Iraq, by the way. When things broke down in Iraq, uh, they took James Steele, who I knew, Colonel, he had been the head of the military group in El Salvador, who had worked with the death squads. They moved him to Iraq, and he organized the Shiite death squads, which carry out a reign of terror uh, to break the Sunni resistance. Uh, and really, if you really want to look at it, create groups like ISIS. Uh, and that's how empire works. And when you're up close, as I was for 20 years, and you see the inner workings of empire, you understand how vicious and ruthless and brutal it is. Um, but it's you know, very hard to penetrate within the heart of empire that reality so that reporters such as myself who would report on these things were under constant attack not only from the State Department and from the government, but from, and I, you know, at eventually I was working for the Dallas Morning News and Central America and later for the New York Times, but from our own Washington bureaus that, uh, you know, were being spun a fictitious narrative and we were kind of demonized as, you know, being the, the, the fifth front of the rebel movement and of course 22 reporters were killed in El Salvador, some of them assassinated by the death squads. Um, it was, you know, they, the pressure that Empire will put on those few reporters who attempt to go out and actually report is, is fierce and, and, and can even involve, you know, the loss of life. In reference to the Iraq War in 2003, and a war, war is a force that gives us meaning, you said that, quote, the notion that the press was used in the war is mm. incorrect. The press wanted to be used. Yeah. Isn't that the antithesis of what journalism should be? wanting to be used. Um, yeah, but you know, journalists are careerists like anyone else and uh, they know how to advance within the system. Uh, so let's take, for instance, the first Gulf War, which I covered with had very draconian press restrictions. So you could only be in a pool. I mean, I didn't do it. I, I mm. speak Arabic. I went out in the desert and then Cheney drew up a list of 10 journalists he wanted expelled, of which I was top of the list, but they couldn't find me because I was sleeping. <laughs> that. I'm just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> You wouldn't think I'd be that hard to find in Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> no, the press goes limp in front of the military. I mean, first of all, you know, real war correspondents, you know, people who really know the culture of war and have covered it, and you're talking a couple dozen, most of them get sent over from their Washington bureau. And I mean, I would literally watch them dress up in military uniforms in, and go sit in a five-star hotel in... Dahran to hear Schwarzkopf and sit in the front row. Um, and they, you know, they uh, weren't anywhere near a war, nor did they want to go near a war. And that's true with every war I covered. Only about 10, 15 percent. Photographers are a little more honest because mm -hmm. they have to get out. Um, they don't really want to cover the war. They're, and, I, and, I, and that's a, you know, covering war is a kind of insanity. I have a kind of even empathy for that. But then you shouldn't be there. Um, and the people who, uh, you know, create these kind of heroic narratives around their soldiers or their leaders and tell the story the way they're rewarded for it. They're rewarded by the institution. They're rewar rewarded by the military itself. Um, and in the first Gulf War, that whole pool system was not actually administered by the military. It was administered by fellow journalists. I mean, I, I used to call them Judenraten. Um, it's insane. Uh, but it, it, it coupled with the fact that they didn't really want to get anywhere near the fighting. That's the, the truth of it. And secondly, that they understood what was good for their career. And, mm. and their career took precedence over the truth. And that's not uncommon, unfortunately. And in 2003, you were booed at Rockford College and you were shamed off stage. I mean, it's just ironic well, because... Well, no, I wasn't shamed off stage. Was, I, don't know, I was forced off stage. You were forced off stage. <laughs> I was willing to keep going. I, they cut my mic. And then campus mic. security suggested that it was time for me to leave. So yeah. It's just the symbolism of that is so ironic because, of course, the, the woman that you were just speaking of earlier and her opposition yeah, to World War I, I um, 
And then we go to the New York Times' response to this, right, right, which is just hysterical because they're saying you're damaging the paper's impartiality. Right. Right. Meanwhile, lauding people like Judith right. Miller at the time who just became literal stenographers. I mean, what was your reaction to that? Did you know at that time that it did just become a complete farce or were you slighted? Well, I knew. I mean, I'd been at the paper for 15 years, so I knew the consequences for a news reporter. Yeah. I mean, a columnist can say, you know, but but of course columnists are selected by the establishment. Um, I would never be selected as a columnist. You would select Thomas Friedman or you know whoever who will, uh, who, who's not gonna make those kinds mm -hmm. of statements. Um, no, I, w I, I was conscious of the game I was playing and the danger in terms of where I was going, but I had spent seven years in the Middle East. I understood the folly of what we were doing. I felt that as an Arabist, I had a platform and a duty to speak because people I cared about would and finally were killed in Iraq. Um, and, you know, I really, it of course, deep sixed my career. But on the other hand, I really couldn't have lived with myself. Given the consequences of what has been done in Iraq, over a million dead, Iraq is a unified country, is never coming back. You know, what is it, four million refugees and displaced? It had one of the most modern infrastructures in the Middle East, it's been destroyed. Um, and and out of these failed states that we created or these you know failed enclaves we've seen the rise of groups like al qaeda in iraq and and which has you know finally morphed into isis so um no i, I was aware of what i was doing um but uh you know i and i nobody likes to lose their job and but i I don't think I could have looked back and done anything differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially since you're covering already the devastation of the Gulf War, uh, targeting of just crucial infrastructure at that point, and then followed by these harsh sanctions that took the life of yeah. half a million children. I mean, how the hell could anyone support this continued military adventure over there? Well, because so much of it's about natural resources. I mean, in terms of, a, you know, they always justify their intervention based on you know, bringing democracy and fighting barbarism, mm -hmm. while everybody sort of turns their back on the Congo, uh, where Horse. atrocities are far worse. So, Cobalt. Yeah, so, um, I, it, you know, Empire had written a column where I said, you know, you can't be a socialist unless you're an anti-imperialist and an anti-militarist, um, because it's really those forces. And, uh, you know, we have to remember that the arms industry is a for-profit industry. Mm -hmm. we, we sell 40% of the world's weapons. Um, uh, we have to break the back of empire, not only for what empire is doing to what Franz Fanon calls the wretched of the earth, but for what it's doing at home, because as it disembowels the country, the harsh forms of control that empire uses on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the homeland. So you get wholesale surveillance, militarized police, indiscriminate use of lethal force on our city streets. Uh, we're in Baltimore, where you don't have to go very far to mm -hmm. see that. Um, and uh, a, a, a destruction of our most basic civil liberties. I mean, this, you know, this is the disease of empire. It goes all the way back to Thucydides, who saw that as Athens expanded, it destroyed its own democracy. So as Thucydides wrote, the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself. And we're no exception. And, and that's what's happening. You know, we, we should be cognizant of the suffering of the Palestinians and the Iraqis and the Afghanis and the Yemenis and the Pakistanis. Um, you know, we should be cognizant of the power of the industrial weapons, the missiles, uh, the thousand pound iron fragmentation bombs that we're dropping. We're not. I mean. You know, I think only those of us who've been near the receiving ends of these weapons understand how uh, widespread this lethal force is, the power of these weapons. Um, but, you know, it ultimately has reverberations for us, which are already very, very extensive. I mean, the, the forms of, that empire uses to control subject populations abroad are now visible on you know, within America itself. Yet even the most quote-unquote populist candidate today, Bernie Sanders, uh, widely popular among, uh, you know, people who are so-called radical leftists, um, he has refused to confront the war industry and the crimes of empire and continues to do so. Right. Uh, you've, you've pointed this out time and again. Um, why is this issue the most important thing to confront? Well, because... 
what you had after World War II with the fusion of the so-called defense industry, the war machine, the arms industry, and the corporatists who profit off of war is what John Ralston Saul correctly calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. Um, and you can't challenge one weapon system. It used to be in the 60s, Proxmire and others would challenge this weapon system. And that's over. Uh, we mask how much we spend. Officially, we spend a little more than 53% of discretionary spending on defense. Well, that's just not true. Uh, it doesn't count veterans' affairs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't count our nuclear weapons program. And, you know, it doesn't count all of the black agendas, black budgets that we're not allowed to see. Um, so best estimates are that we're spending $1.6, $1.7 trillion a year. And you can't talk about serious reform when you are uh, diverting such massive amounts of your resources uh, towards, towards, towards the war machine. Uh, Martin, that's what Martin Luther King's 1967 speech at Riverside Church understood. Um, that we can't build what Johnson called the great, the new society, the great society, and maintain imperial war. Um, uh, so, you know, Bernie has voted for every military appropriations bill there is to continue these wars. He doesn't challenge either the military establishment. Indeed, he's been quite welcoming of defense contractors uh, into the state of Vermont because, you know, provides jobs and, you know, they, they try and divvy up Ten billion dollars per state because they have mm. the ability to do so. Um, but if we don't break the back of the war machine, if we don't break the imperialist project, if we don't terminate the for-profit arms industry, uh, then you know any rhetoric about significant change is smoke in the wind. Yeah, and interestingly enough, that's when Martin Luther King Jr. began to be obsolete in the mainstream media and. You know, exiled largely when he started talking about militarism. They took away was, his FBI protection, yeah. and and both King and Johnson knew what that meant. Meant because of the number of death threats he received, it meant he was doomed. And you quoted Angles in one of your recent speeches on this point, which said yeah. that it's either barbarism or socialism. Yeah, it's often forward. attributed to Luxembourg. She stole it, but uh, it did come from Engels. Yes, it's it is really between barbarism or socialism. Either we reconfigure our relationship to each other and to the planet in a radical way, or these forces, uh, which in you know, theological terms are forces of death, will extinguish what hope we have for life. It, it's that dire, it's that dramatic, as anyone who reads climate change reports understand. Um, and this is the folly of empire. This is how empires mm -hmm. destroy themselves and always have. I mean, it's how the Roman Empire, you expand militarily beyond your capacity to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what we're doing and what we've done. And the consequences of it, uh, politically, economically, socially, culturally, and finally environmentally, are catastrophic. We hear about revolution in the U.S. like it's some uh, romanticized thing, that it can never happen here, something that only happens in other places. Uh, but you've covered so many uprisings, some successful. What has it taught you about the potential for revolution here? Well, when a political system is seized by a tiny cabal, uh, whatever it is, military oligarchs, and the system seizes up and only serves the interests of that narrow elite, um, then there is always blowback. Uh, that blowback may not be good. I mean, if you go back to the 1930s, that blowback came in the form of fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1930s in the United States, it came uh, from an enlightened oligarchy led by Roosevelt, and Roosevelt writes about it quite openly. That's, that's, uh, in, in, in essence, he says to his fellow oligarchs, either you give up some of your money or we really face the specter of revolution. Um, and we, had, we still had the old Communist Party. You know, we had uh, movements we severely weakened after World War I, but they were still there, uh, the Progressive Party and others, uh, that um, – were able to frighten the oligarchs into creating the New Deal, 15 million jobs, public works, all these kinds of things, many of which, you know, the parks and the post offices, although they're trying to sell off the post office, as they did in Britain, um, uh, you know, we still use today. Um, but after World War II, those forces set out to destroy the, you know, Roosevelt used to say my greatest achievement is that I saved capitalism. You just wrote a, a great essay that I encourage everyone to read titled The Real Enemies Within in which you write, the reality of empire is nearly impossible to see from the heart of empire. 
There can be no rational debate about empire with many desperate Americans who have ingested this as their creed. The distortion of neoliberalism has left them little else. It's a potent and dangerous force within the body politic, and it is growing. You know, of course, those who point out the symptoms of a rotting empire are deemed heretics, traitors, just like they've been since World War I. Uh, what does this long-standing inability to counter this dominant narrative tell us about our society, where it is today, and how we can possibly combat this mythology? Well, it's a symptom of the sickness of the society itself. So as people are pushed, I mean, for instance, I was just not too long ago in the South, and you have one Confederate memorial after another. I was walking through Montgomery with the great civil rights attorney, Brian Stevenson, who spent his life defending death row prisoners, most of whom were poor and black, of course, in Alabama. And he said, all this stuff's been put up in the last 10 years. And I said to Brian, this is exactly what happened in Yugoslavia that as people reached such a point of despair, they retreated into these mythical stories about themselves. Um, and at that point, you, you, you can't connect because you're not, you're not speaking about a reality that is defined by verifiable fact. You're speaking about a myth. And I find the rhetoric against Muslims and even the acts now that are carried out against Muslims extremely frightening. I mean, that kind of rhetoric is incendiary. I saw it in every war I covered. You get people to speak in the language of violence and then they carry out acts of indiscriminate violence. Um, I think we're entering a very frightening and dangerous moment in American history as the government is increasingly, of course, hostage to corporate power and military power, unable to respond to the citizenry, carrying out acts of austerity, stripping us of our civil liberties. We're the most watched, spied upon, photographed, monitored population in human history, and I covered the Stasi state in East Germany. Um, uh, you will ignite. Um, these proto-fascist forces. Um, and it will become sacralized in the Christian religion. Uh, and it speaks in the gun culture and the language of violence. And it is a symptom of a dying civilization. Uh, because in the end, all this is is magical thinking. It's not real. And I think the only way to save ourselves, which is why I'm a socialist, is to reintegrate these people into the economic system. And in essence, give them hope, give them the possibility of a life. Uh, but in fact, of course, we're doing the opposite. We're uh, pushing them further and further into extremists. And as we do that, that will have very frightening political consequences. And there are no shortage of examples throughout human history to prove that. Thank you so much, Chris Hedges. Thank you. An honor. The year is 1917, and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The Twelve found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, 
Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world and the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. <laughs>